tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Well, hello again, friends. Welcome back to the East Texas Swamp. Tonight I'm going to pull some strings for you. Maybe not the way you imagine, I mean, but you'll just have to wait and see about that. Oh, glad you made it, Chester. Here, you want to come on inside? You can sit on our friend's lap here. Uh, what? You don't like alligators? Well, all right, I understand. Three's a crowd. Sorry, Chester. Maybe next time, bud. Ah, Billy Acre. Well, you just sit right there, friend. I'll just be a second. Hmm. Oh, yeah, baby. Nothing like a little healthy carbon monoxide to clear away the hydrogen sulfide. Swamp gas, you know. Just trying to keep a clean house out here. So smoke them if you got them and... Oh, shit, that one had a kick. I just sanitized my entire respiratory system. Uh, drink your glasses to the bottom. Because old Drew Blood has a tale to tell. If I can catch my fucking breath. This is season one, episode 18 of Drew Blood. <laughs> Some folks call them Drew Blood. I call them Drew Blood. Mm -hmm. Reckon you're listening to the standard edition of the program. Mm. If you want to add free versions, visit simplyscarypodcast.com. Mm. Click Patrons in the upper menu. Mm. I reckon you get instant access at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Reckon where that potted meat is. Mm -hmm. Let's get down to business. Tonight we return to the black pantheons of literary heavyweight Curtis M. Lawson, a man who can charge sigils just by looking at them. Seriously, I've seen him do it. Creepy stuff. Anyway, this one tells the real story of Pinocchio, not the cute children's version you might be more familiar with. See, playing with puppets isn't all fun and games. So, without stringing you along any further, from author Curtis M. Lawson, I give you Pinocchio in the Black Pantheon. Once upon a time, a deep rumbling issued from Geppetto's stomach. A half a loaf of stale bread sat in his cupboard. It was to be saved for tomorrow. Meals, and as much as you could apply the term to a few slivers of bread, had become a once-a-day event. The life of a puppeteer was meager at times, especially when there was superior competition. The marionette theater of Dante Lasses, a young and talented puppet master, had left Geppetto's work seeming dull and old-fashioned. Dante's shows included innovative design, elaborate stages, and mechanical props. While Geppetto's creations showed a traditional ascetic, and skilled craftsmanship, Dante's puppets were wild, bizarre, and varied. Geppetto was true to the past. Dante was forging the future. The old puppeteer had tried to compete with his younger competition, of course. His workshop was filled with failed experiments, abominations carved from wood. While his rival's work may have been odd and stylized, Geppetto's own attempts to break away from tradition were frighteningly alien. Decapitated, pharaonic figures with tongues darting out from their gaping necks sat discarded beside blind sorcerers with mouths fixed in eternal screams of madness. Tiny wooden frogmen hung from their strings, the wind making them dance around a winged squid with jointed tentacles. These were more than failures. They were ugly, unchristian things. Geppetto found it disturbing that his mind had summoned such images. And what had inspired him to give those nightmares physical shape? Desperation and hunger, he supposed. This experimentation with his monstrous creations met poor reception. His new puppets were too grotesque for the public's taste. Too grotesque for his own taste as well. 
Now Geppetto placed his last hopes of saving his career in a most peculiar solution that promised to make his traditional marionettes far more intriguing than Dante's mechanized props or wild designs. In more bountiful times, he would have scoffed at such nonsense. Hunger and fear are the parentages of faith, though. Geppetto found his hope in the pages of an ancient text. If it worked, this would ground his show in the old rather than the new. Being an elderly man, he took comfort in old things. The text, a small booklet bound together with leather cord, was called the Libro de la Navi. He had been given the book by an old gypsy woman in his youth. The woman had been so impressed with his show that she had gifted the text to him, claiming it was a priceless study on puppetry. The volume, which had been morbidly amusing, depicted formulas and incantations for animating marionettes with a life of their own. The booklet's author claimed that the process described was a modification of the Jewish magic used to create golems. It also warned that such magic was not to be invoked under the wrong stars or some such astrological nonsense. In addition to the tools of his trade, chisels, files, saws, Geppetto had less mundane implements laid out on his workbench. Exotic herbs ground together with the beaks of octopus, dyes made from blood and marrow. The puppet he had chosen for this was his favorite, a little boy for which he had no name, though it was the oldest piece in his collection. In his shows, he would give it the name of a child in the crowd. Geppetto had carved a wooden boy 20 years prior, just before his career began to take off. In what had been a lonely life, the nameless puppet had many times seemed like a son to the puppet master. The process of animation required precision and painstaking detail. This was no problem. Geppetto was a master craftsman, with patience and an artist's eye. His hands might be wrinkled, but they were steady. After the symbols were etched, odd, curvaceous characters set within geometric anomalies, Geppetto placed a single drop of the blood and marrow mixture in the center of the symbol on the puppet's chest. To Geppetto's amazement and delight, the red mixture spread out through the etchings. Like a flowing river, it filled the curving lines of the chest glyph, and then the crimson gel bled out to the lines connecting with the other symbols. It was as if some unseen muscle was pumping the mixture along. Every line began to darkly glisten. Without consciously acting, Geppetto gave audible form to the incantation written within the pages of the Libro della Navi. The alien word slipped off the old man's tongue effortlessly. A red glow came from the blood-etched glyphs on the wooden body. The volume of Geppetto's voice grew and his timber climbed higher. The unearthly glow within the symbols grew brighter in turn. Driven by some external volition, Geppetto sprinkled the powder bone and beak over the wooden boy. As the final words were invoked, the iridescence faded and the wooden boy's mahogany eyes shot open in a quick and violent manner. Behind them were windows to the star-smeared blackness of space. If the eyes truly are the gateway to the soul, then whatever spirit gave life to this puppet was as old and as dark as the void between worlds. With his heart in his throat, Geppetto commanded the puppet to rise. A moment later, it did just that. He foolishly believed this to be the proof of the creature's subjugation to him. This confusion was soon clarified. Screaming hate in a language older than the stars, the marionette's nose grew into a sharp point, and it lunged for Geppetto's face. Though the words were foreign to the aged puppeteer, their meaning was clear. The puppet stabbed the tip of his nose into Geppetto's cornea with an uncanny celerity. The wound was not deep enough to kill, but it ruined the eye. Geppetto stumbled backwards and fell to the floor. The wooden demon was still perched on his chest. Its bloody nose was positioned just a fraction of an inch away from his remaining good eye. The puppet stopped for a moment and blinked. It looked as if it were thinking, 
trying to find the words it wanted. You don't command me, flesh thing. I command you. The meter of its words was uneven. Its voice was a pieced together mishmash of syllables stolen from the mouths of others. Oh God! Tears and snot streamed down the puppet master's face as he breathed the words. Speak not of God. The truth of God would make you weep and defecate, mortal. The disjointed words of the animated nightmare swatted away Geppetto's prayer. God would grind your soul to dust, but be not you as use for you. That night, while the stars were right, Geppetto brought unwholesome life into all his most hated creations. Pinocchio had insisted. By dawn, it was more than just a wooden boy who moved with the will of terrible otherworldly things. The tongue-headed pharaoh licked at the remnants of blood and marrow on the workbench. Knee-high sorcerers formed a circle, screaming ugly mantras in a clumsy language. Tiny frogmen tortured insects and presented them to the click and hinge tentacles of a somnambulant cedar monster. Pinocchio sat on Geppetto's shoulder, looking out at the pantheon of dark gods. His wooden hand stroked the puppeteer's hair. Geppetto had seen too many impossible things that night, and he had touched the soul of madness and hate itself. Insanity loomed beckoning him into its embrace. But Pinocchio would not allow the puppeteer such release just yet. What now? Geppetto asked, knowing that his ordeal was far from over. In fact, he feared it would never end. Now, flesh thing, we put on a show. Dante Lasses was an egoistic young man. He was the kind of person who, with a mixture of luck and natural talent, had met with success early on in life. Success had come to Dante a bit too easily, though, to the detriment of his character. For the last few years, he had been Italy's most notable puppeteer. His innovative shows had been performed for wealthy merchants, royalty, and even high-ranking clergy. He was, indisputably, the only performer in his field that mattered. Why, then, was he hearing so much chatter about Geppetto's stringless wonders? What could that washed-up has-been be doing to garner so much attention? Fate, rather than luck, provided an opportunity for Dante to see the wonders of Pinocchio in the Black Pantheon. As Dante was packing up his own show, he was approached by a young woman with a lunatic gaze. Her bulbous eyes looked like they wanted to escape her face. She extended her arm toward Dante, offering him a handwritten flyer. Do come see the show, she said with an uneven voice. The flyer boasted of a wooden boy with eyes like a midnight sky in August. Scrawling letters promised the Black Pantheon who calls fire from the sky and several other outlandish claims. All things could look impressive with proper calligraphy, thought Dante. He was skeptical that Geppetto could fulfill such promises, even if the old man had crafted some innovative manner of marionette. His storytelling was juvenile and stale. To Dante's surprise, the commons which hosted Geppetto's show were teeming with spectators. Though many were natives of Florence, it was clear that a large minority had hailed from across Italy. Dante recognized several men in the crowd who had no reason to be in the city. Merchants from Milan, a prostitute he knew from Venice. Even Cardinal Benedici was in attendance, accompanied by several nuns. The people he recognized, as well as those grouped amongst him, had a look of manic delight on their faces. They all stood at the back of the audience, trembling with anticipation. Some of the Florentine locals were commenting on how these excited folks in the back had been following the Black Pantheon across Italy. 
after the first performance of this new show, so Dante heard from the gossiping crowd, a dozen people left their homes to follow Geppetto and glean each performance. This was happening, at least according to the rumors, at each locale where the Black Pantheon had been performed. There were darker rumors murmured on the lips of the Florentines as well. Stories bounced back and forth of how a month after the Black Pantheon had left Venice, a third of the city drowned themselves, dragging down anyone within reach beneath the canals. Wilder still were the tales that days after the mass suicide, the canals were teeming with demonic mermen. Whispers danced through the crowd, tales that balls of lightning had rolled through Milan, burning and shattering anything and anyone who had not followed Geppetto out. Padua was supposedly steeped in anarchy and civil unrest. Bologna, according to one young man, had been left as a ghost town with no sign of what caused the city's inhabitants to flee. Perhaps the wildest report was that Pisa had crumbled into the Tyrrhenian Sea. It was all nonsense as far as Dante was concerned. Old Geppetto had come up with a clever ploy to draw in crowds. A grim little puppet show that leaves death and darkness in its wake. People are a curious and sadistic lot. What truly intrigued Dante was the size of the stage. Dante himself worked with a large set, but this was an enormous wooden structure, scaled for a full-on work of drama. What could the Black Pantheon possibly offer to warrant such a space? Two curtains ran across the front of the stage. A large black sheet of velvet hung from ten foot above the stage down to the floor. The second curtain was a burgundy color which spanned a four-foot space above the black. This higher curtain was the first to rise. The crowd hushed as a little wooden boy was revealed, sitting high up on a plank of wood above the lower curtain. His eyes were as black as night with specks of cosmic light. In those eyes, each spectator could see every secret shame and pain of their souls reflected back at them. Some began to weep. Others averted their gaze. Pinocchio surveyed the crowd. Taking his time, the wooden boy made eye contact with all who looked upon him. A primal and inexplicable fear encroached upon Dante's soul as the marionette locked eyes with him. A voice drifted out of Pinocchio's cellulose body. It was the small sound of a young boy, but held within was the rage and pain of Apollyon, Prometheus, and Loki. Though his words said, Welcome all to the Black Pantheon, his tone communicated something else. It said, I have returned, and I am your end. Pleasantly cheerful music from some unseen calliope began to play as the lower curtain parted, revealing Geppetto, who was standing with two marionettes. One was the decapitated black pharaoh with its flickering tongue. With his other hand he held the controls for an Arab sorcerer with insane rage permanently carved into its face. Geppetto stood silently sobbing as the two marionettes bowed at the front of the stage. The old puppeteer was haggard and emaciated. His eyes were sunken into his skull and one had lost all color. His hair looked thinner than Dante had remembered, as did his body. The most disturbing thing about Geppetto's appearance was the presence of stitches running from the inside of his elbows to the base of his wrists. The skin around the sutures was puffy and raised red with infection milky fluid oozed down his arms. Health is oftentimes the cost of success, Dante thought. This notion was a desperate mental guard against the darker, more disturbing inclinations going through the young puppeteer's mind. The puppets were abhorrent, yes, but no reason to submit oneself to ludicrous and superstitious thinking. Pinocchio's mouth opened, and the wails of hell blew out. The sound was not perceived by the ears, rather it vibrated through the soul. Following the infernal resonance, Pinocchio struggled to find words in the limited language of man that would properly express his anger and intent. It was like an exterminator screaming at insects as to why he was killing them. Man, 
is a vain beast with delusions of Godhead. He views creation through a warped lens also that he may place his world at the center of all things. The wooden pharaoh's tongue flicked out like a stiletto, cutting the strings which held it up. With no support from the puppet master, the wooden king stood proud and moved of its own accord. The tiny hands of the screaming sorcerer lit bright with flame, burning away its tethers. Even as the two puppets leaped off the ground and began clambering up Geppetto's arms, Dante's mind was wildly grasping for logic and reason. The fire could be explained by a device of flint and alcohol preps. The puppet's semen animation could be the work of thin strings and an unseen assistant. What happened next, though, Dante could find no method to explain away. Puppets thinking they pulled the strings is what you are. But we will show you the world as it is. While Pinocchio spoke, the carved monsters which had clambered up Geppetto's arms now began to unstitch him, from the elbow down to the wrist. Once his flesh had been opened, revealing soft tissue, muscle, and bone, the pharaoh and the Arab ripped a large artery from each of his arms, letting them dangle at the wrist. Some of the crowd stood transfixed, enthralled by the violence on stage. Others cried and trembled. Others still attempted to run away, only to be met by the Black Pantheon's followers waiting at the back of the crowd. Any who tried to leave, be they man, woman, or child, were met with the fists, boots, teeth, and nails of Pinocchio's faithful. Dante looked around as an orgy of madness developed. The gathered spectators were beginning to cry and laugh. Men were grabbing the closest people to them, regardless of sex or age, and forcing themselves upon them. An old woman only a few feet from Dante began to pleasure herself with one hand while clawing deep gouges into her own face with the other. On stage, Geppetto's arteries ascended skyward, causing the old man's arms to jerk upwards. The bloody organic string skithered straight into the hands of Pinocchio above. Dante felt insanity overwhelming him and tried to fight it off with logic. Looking toward the stage, watching the old man paraded about like a marionette, he could read Geppetto's lips. Kill me. Dante wished he could oblige Geppetto. Instead, he decided to flee. Before he could turn and run, strong hands grabbed his arm and forced it behind his back. A moment later his face was smashed into the ground as he found himself prone with his ass up in the air. Behind him, some massive man was laughing and grunting. Dante struggled to regain control of his arm, fearing what depraved act his attacker had in mind. It was no use. His beastly assailant was immensely strong. Dante reached back, hoping to retrieve a carving knife which he kept tucked in his boot. The attacker torqued his arm further, snapping it. The young puppeteer, unaccustomed to pain, let out a high-pitched squeal. The fire in his nerves overcame him, and the thought of the makeshift weapon escaped his mind. Drinking in Dante's pain, his attacker continued his assault with fervor. Several times, the behemoth smashed Dante's face into the packed earth. The impact left his world spinning, before he could take stock of what had happened, he was hoisted above the crowd. His dangling broken arm and bloody face incited the spectators to claw and tear at him. Ungodly pain overcame Dante as a half dozen Florentines screamed out blasphemies and ripped the flesh from his bones. Dante Lacesse's final glimpse of the world was the image of Geppetto arms flayed with the end of the cosmos playing out on the stage around him. The older puppeteer was staring sadly toward him with tears streaming down his cheeks. The last sound was the exultant chanting of unpronounceable names, accompanied by the cheerful tune of a calliope.
from the darkness of his crate where Pinocchio kept him between performances, Geppetto wept. He had learned to become virtually silent in his sorrow. The demonic things which possessed his puppets took immense delight in his suffering, and he would not willingly feed their depraved appetites. He imagined that even in his silence they could somehow taste his pain, seeping through the pores of his glyph-etched wooden prison. Pain was the reason Geppetto was allowed, or perhaps forced, to keep his sanity. Nature would have delivered any man to the merciful arms of madness if they had seen a fraction of the horrors which he had witnessed. The Black Pantheon willed that the puppeteer be restrained within the confines of lucidity. His suffering was married to his sanity, and his suffering was a key part of the show. He was a symbol to mankind that resistance met only with despair. Despair was worsened by hope. Geppetto still hoped, albeit faintly, that Pinocchio could be stopped. It was this tiny spark in the darkness which had inspired the wild gambit that he was now waiting for to pan out. Geppetto, having something of a reputation, was allowed to solicit spectators in new cities. He was chaperoned, of course, by one of Pinocchio's faithful. The zealots who followed the Black Pantheon were detached madmen. Their disassociation from the mindset of baseline humanity left the enslaved showmen some room for acts of undetected subversion. In Florence, Geppetto had suggested to a former priest who now found God in the void of Pinocchio's eyes that they solicit businessmen in the poorest district of the city. His explanation was that the destitute and desperate are in the most need of entertainment and also most easily swayed. To the priest, this made perfect sense. He followed Geppetto into a tavern that looked as if it catered to a rougher element of humanity. Insisting that he understood the poor far more intimately than a member of the clergy could, Geppetto suggested that his lead should be followed. The priest was not to speak under any conditions. The two sat at the bar. Geppetto had ordered a glass of wine for each of them, the cheapest they had. To his right sat a rugged-looking man bearing more scars than the life of an honest city dweller should warrant. The poor condition of his clothes contrasted with the fine quality of the booze he was drinking. This helped to show that his priorities were also out of line with those of a hard-working but underprivileged citizen. Uh, drinking the good stuff, eh? You must have a kind of boss that didn't we do. The rugged, scarred man simply grunted in a dismissive but non-threatening way. Ah, the bastard is a rolling in gold. Geppetto continued, talking into his glass like a disgruntled drunk. And here we are, the talent and the manpower, stuck drinking a swill. The rugged man took the bait and turned toward Geppetto. That's a real shame, Fred. Who is it you work for? Geppetto downed the cheap wine before catching his new bar friend's gaze. Some fat Spanish bastard named Vega. I'm a puppeteer in his travel in the show. I'm the talent, but he fronted the startup money. You know how it is. I'm working for swill wine while he gets rich. The rugged man slapped Geppetto on the back in a friendly manner. Uh, that's a real shame, friend. Where the world, though? Producing two coins from his purse, the scar-faced man ordered a glass of the finest wine for Geppetto and the priest. These rounds are on me, boys. So, tell me, how long is the show in town? Bringing the discussion back to the show eased the priest. He was beginning to feel that Geppetto's lies were being used as allegory, so that he may complain about their master with impunity. Now he believed that Geppetto was manipulating this poor, wretched beast into seeing the show. And we leave with the day after next. Then we head south out of the city for four days of miserable travel. And that is how Geppetto set the stage for his insurrection against the gods of darkness. He handed this criminal the time and place where the caravan would be. 
Shirley dreams of the gold he spoke of would inspire the bandit to attack the caravan and make off with the promised loot. Of course, there was no gold, as the Black Pantheon had no need of it. The chaos of an ambush on the caravan might just distract his captors long enough for him to escape. Despair and hope danced in Geppetto's head as he waited for the attack, which might never come. From the confines of his crate, time was almost non-existent. He could have been waiting for minutes, or perhaps he was already approaching the next town which his creations would use as a further stepping stone toward human extinction. Then came the sounds of salvation, the thunk of arrows into wooden carts, the panic neighing of horses. This was Geppetto's chance. The waning moon hid behind a veil of clouds, diffusing what little light there was into a glowing haze. The dim light from the will of the wisp sky was obscured further by the thick canopy of overhead leaves which made this portion of road seem more like a tunnel. Antonio could not have asked for better conditions. Just as the drunken puppeteer had told him, the caravan of the Black Pantheon clunked and clattered down the road. It was odd that they traveled at night and with no lamps or torches. The puppeteer had explained that his boss was a greedy bastard not prone to waste time on frivolities such as making camp for the night. In that light, Antonio reasoned the lack of light made sense. With all that gold, they wouldn't want to call attention from bandits. Still, there was something unsettling about the dark procession of carriages. Having waited for the majority of the carts to hit a wide turn in the road, one that would make it hard to run forward or retreat, Antonio whistled. On his signal, arrows began to rain upon the caravan. The horses were the first targets, meeting painful ends as razor-tipped shafts tore through their muscled flesh. As the beasts fell or panicked, the carts came to a quick halt, some of them tipping onto their sides. The scene was a mess of shattered wood, spurting blood, and the frantic screams of animals in pain. Antonio watched eight of his men drop their bows and rush toward the carts. Descending upon the caravan, each man produced a weapon more conducive to close-up fighting, stilettos and clubs mostly. Antonio himself stayed in the wood line with two other archers. If there happened to be a real fighter amongst the showmen, it would be better for someone else to discover it. That kind of thinking had served him well in a long life of crime. No sooner had the bandits began breaking open the doors of the carts and carriages than the zealous servants of the Black Pantheon poured out of the vehicles with mad rage. Antonio's men began the melee strong, smashing the skulls or introducing organs to the cold kiss of steel. Less than a minute passed before the tide had changed. In their previous experience, ambushes on artisans were met with panic and submission. But the servants of Pinocchio knew no fear. The faithful fought back with no concern for themselves. The bandits were overwhelmed by both sheer numbers and raw ferocity. The members of the caravan lunged at their armed aggressors with nothing but fists and teeth. Antonio watched from the trees, astounded as this mass of human monsters ripped his men to bits. Neither knife nor club had any effect unless the blow delivered an instant kill. Pain was not a factor for them. The remaining archers loosed arrows into the mob of lunatics who tore, beat, and ate their partners in crime. Antonio, gripped by a deep and primal fear, took several steps back. Fear, in Antonio's opinion, was a powerful survival tool. But like all tools, it had to be controlled and mastered. This payday could still be salvaged if he kept a cool head. Embracing the darkness like a protective cloak, he hoped the mob would see only the other two men. It seemed that this was indeed the case as several blood-drenched psychotics turned their gaze toward the wood line. He quickly flanked around the corner of the bin, hoping the horror show on the road would cover up the noise of his steps. His eyes bounced back and forth between the madmen storming toward his archers and an ornate cart with barred windows. Antonio waited a few seconds, looking for any sign of life in what he was sure was the bank carriage. 
There could be a guard or two in there, covering the gold under any and all circumstances. Better to fight a few professionals than to swarm in mass of crazies just around the bend. With that thought in mind, Antonio made a hasty break for the carriage that he believed was his last chance at the money. Powered by adrenaline and fear, the scar-faced bandit raced across the road. In one single motion, he burst through the door of the carriage. Antonio was amazed to find no guards at all. All that sat in the cart was a single locked chest, ornately carved with symbols of odd design. Less interested in the craftsmanship of the chest than in its contents, Antonio pulled a club out from his belt and in three strikes managed to smash the lock from its hasp. He had hoped to take all the gold. That was a bit unreasonable under the current circumstances. On the bright side, there would be no one left to divvy up his loot with and no one he would have to double cross. That being taken into consideration, Antonio felt that simply filling his satchel from the chest should be a more than adequate prize. As the wicked man bent down to open the chest, he was beaten to the punch. As if possessed with a life of its own, the lid flew open, catching Antonio on the chin. He stumbled back, bleeding and confused. He stood dumbstruck, holding his jaw as the old puppeteer from the bar leapt out of the chest and drove a carving knife deep into his stomach. <coughs> Lying on the floor, bleeding and unable to crawl away, Antonio listened to the fleeing steps of the old man. Strangely, instead of pondering death or God or even his own pain, Antonio simply wanted to know why the man was locked in a box. The implications terrified him though he couldn't begin to guess the truth. Drifting in and out of consciousness several times, Antonio awoke to what he was sure was a pre-death hallucination. Standing on his chest was a child carved from wood with eyes like the sky at night. His face was a rosy-cheeked smile, which somehow projected every vile thought in existence. The wooden boy spoke, and Antonio's arteries tore through the flesh of his arms, just as the layers of his mind were peeled back and etched with the burning sorrow of cosmic truth. Geppetto walked through the streets of Florence, unafraid of what the public might infer from his blood-drenched clothes or the festering stitches on his arms. There was no public left, or at least very little. Those not already left as awful in the streets were gibbering in corners or delighting in the most extreme masochisms. When one of the crazed denizens of this glorious city-turned-necropolis did notice him, they were overwhelmed by awe. Geppetto was, after all, Pinocchio's chosen one. He could have run ahead to the next town on the Black Pantheon's parade of destruction. He could have warned them. But even if they paid mind to the mad ravens of a sickly vagrant, what good would it do? No sword or arrow would stop Pinocchio or the Black Pantheon. Instead, Geppetto sought out a weapon of true power which may cast out the horrors he had brought upon the world. The Libro delle Navi was supposedly based on the Kabbalistic magics of the Jews, so it was to the ghetto of Florence that Geppetto sought out the knowledge which would be his weapon of insurrection. The ghetto had not been spared, and like the rest of Florence, the streets were filled with ash, entrails, and occasional madmen. To his relief, the synagogue still stood with only minor defacement to the exterior. The heavy wooden doors bore smears the color of rust. Thoughts of lamb blood painted doors flashed through his mind, though it was a safe bet that this was not the blood of any lamb. Weak from exhaustion, infection, and atrophy, Geppetto was barely able to push open the doors. Once inside, he was met with shock. Standing in the center of the temple, Eyes set skyward stood a rabbi. His clothes were not ripped nor covered in gore. His body bore no scratches, bruises, or lacerations. His back was to the puppeteer, though, 
and Geppetto was sure that what would turn around would be monstrous. He was wrong. The man that turned toward him was old but able-bodied and wore a look of humility and sincerity. The rabbi regarded Geppetto with a sad smile. His face held no sign of fear or malice. Extending both hands outward, he spoke. Welcome, Geppetto. The Lord told me you would come. It took longer for Geppetto and Rabbi Blennis to catch up to the Black Pantheon than they would have liked. Geppetto's infections were worsening, and without the unholy magics of Pinocchio keeping him stable, death was surely around the corner. His illness made for slow travel. Eventually, after passing through two ravaged villages, the two caught up to the Doomsday Parade. No matter how noble, it would be absurd for two men to attack the Black Pantheon alone. Geppetto and Blanis had not come alone, though. Using puppets left over from Dante Lasses in Florence, the puppeteer and the rabbi created new golems. One was an anthropomorphic fox with a cane, the other a blindfolded cat of similar nature. Both had been animated by methods akin to those taught in the Libro delle Navi. Blanis had explained that these puppets would be possessed by angels. The Black Pantheon was about to begin their show in the marketplace of Siena. Geppetto and Blanis stood disguised amongst the spectators. The old puppet master feared Pinocchio or one of his ilk would sense him. Blanis assured him that they were cloaked by faith. As the lunatic followers of Pinocchio passed him in the marketplace without a second glance, Geppetto began to feel more confident. Perhaps the dark gods inhabiting his puppets were not all-powerful. With a newfound, if shaky, faith in cosmic justice, Geppetto waited for the curtain to lift. It was imperative to wait for the show to begin. God had told Blanus that the masses must see the Lord's wrath firsthand. The first curtain was already up and Pinocchio surveyed the crowd to the upbeat tune of the Calliope. Tonight's show shall be different, the puppet said in a voice that echoed Hell's thunder. The second curtain ascended skyward. On stage, in Geppetto's usual place of honor, the scar-faced thief named Antonio staggered back and forth. A terrible punishment had befallen him for causing the loss of the Black Pantheon's favorite performer. A twinge of guilt came over Geppetto for not having cut the man's throat. Tonight, you will witness firsthand the battle for your world. The daydream of God will be ground to dust by the real thing. The starry discs that were the Dark God's eyes set straight upon Geppetto as he spoke. He could feel the evil thing's gaze on his soul. Pinocchio knew he was there. Your move, father! The mocking tone was filled with such hate that Geppetto almost stood down. But this was not only his last chance, it was also the world's last chance. Assuring himself that there could be no more noble way to meet oblivion, Geppetto took a step forward. Blanis patted Geppetto's back assuredly as the two men walked through the gathered mass. Beside the rabbi and the puppeteer, walking on their own volition, were the lame fox and blind cat. The men and women of Siena cleared a path and watched in confused awe as the forces of good strode toward the heart of chaos. This was the moment of truth and judgment. It would not come again. With each step, Geppetto felt more righteous and confident. His strength was returning as he walked with angels into battle. And then, as he truly believed for the first time that the God of Light would come through, he felt his knee snap. <laughs> Pain overwhelmed him as he hit the ground. Geppetto wasn't sure what had happened until he saw the fox's cane swinging toward his face. Somewhere behind the sound of his own heartbeat, Geppetto could hear Blanis laughing. The blind cat assaulted Geppetto's face. 
its dull wooden claws leaving splinters in its flesh. The fox continued pummeling the old man with its cane. Blennis stood above him, cackling and spitting. Geppetto couldn't help but notice how much he resembled the mad Arab sorcerers which had come to life and turned against him. <laughs> the Lord did tell me you would come, Geppetto. <laughs> and he commanded I return to him what is his. <laughs> Geppetto wept on the ground as the last fragments of hope dissolved from his heart. He now knew, beyond all doubt, that Blanis spoke the truth. There was no hope. The end would not be wrought by the final judgment of a heavenly patriarch. The end was here, and it was the black anger of a malevolent universe. Pinocchio stretched out his arms as madness overtook the crowd. His wooden mouth contorted as he spoke the words that Geppetto already knew. We are the angels, father. The truth of God is that he acts through we. <laughs> You've been listening to Pinocchio in the Black Pantheon by Curtis M. Lawson. You know, Les Coleman once said, puppets go to sleep the moment they break free from their strings. Now, I'm not exactly sure who Les Coleman is, but I guess it doesn't matter too much because he's obviously full of shit. In any case, our pal Curtis M. Lawson reminds us that desperation doesn't always lead to good decision making. And going back to our pal Joseph Sinamo's story a while back, whether you come across a Libro de Vicui, or a Libro del Navi, or really a Libro de anything, take it from me, you're better off staying clear of it. To hell with Libros, friends. They're just too dangerous to mess around with. Just listen to them on audio, right? Remember, Drew Blood's here to keep you guys safe. A little about the author. Curtis M. Lawson is an author of unapologetically weird and transgressive fiction, fantastical graphic novels, and dark poetry. Curtis's work ranges from technicolor pulp adventures to bleak cosmic horror. Curtis is a member of the Horror Writers Association and organizer of the Weird Live Horror Reading Series. He lives in Massachusetts with his wife and their son. If you've enjoyed this story, I highly recommend this collection, Black Pantheons, from which this story came. It's available in Kindle and print, along with his many other excellent works. You can also check out his podcast, Weird Transmissions, spelled W-Y-R-D, Transmissions, featuring interviews with Laird Barron, Ramsey Campbell, Erie Vaughn, and many more. Also worth a mention, he has a new hardcover edition out for his newest book, Devil's Night featuring 14 tales of interconnected urban dread with full-color illustrations, available now at weirdhousepress.com. Please remember to stop by our iTunes page or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It helps more than you might think. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillintalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating all the way back to 2012 including past episodes of this program, all our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. Thanks for your time and for supporting our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you help support this show. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there where you'll get all our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook and Twitter, as well as Instagram. I'd like to mention that we are accepting submissions. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on this show, 
send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you can rip the arteries out of my arms and work me like a puppet. Metaphorically, of course. Well, friends, I'm afraid this is where we part ways. At least till next time. So grab a drink for the road, but don't get too creative with your driving on the way home. Health is sometimes the price you pay for success, but let's not get all banged up when there's really no need for it. So until next week, friend, may the wind be at your back, may the road rise up to meet you, and remember, don't be a vain beast with delusions of Godhead. It almost never turns out like you think it will. <laughs> Good night, y'all.